Salam alaikum everyone. I see we have several people who've joined us now. Um, I'm going to be mindful of Dr. Burmer's time and, and all of yours time. So, you know, there's several wonderful sessions going on, um, but hopefully we'll be able to share the recordings with you for anything that you may have missed. To introduce Dr. Burner, I've known her for many years, um, dear friend, colleague, and we have been, and some of you may know, Susna had um, worked with, with the Johns Hopkins Institute of Education Policy, the School Culture Survey, we sent out information about. Mr. Sophia, we're actually still not on time yet. It's it's before 11. Oh, we officially okay. started 11.05. Okay, maybe let me wait. Can... So I won't, so I'll introduce, I'll introduce Dr. Burner at noon, inshallah, noon Eastern time. I know we have people from different time zones. We're going to um, allow all of you to just, you know, put questions in the chat box as we go. Dr. Burner is happy to answer any questions even in between our presentations. So no worries there. I'm interested as we're waiting for people to come in as mm -hmm. to how many of the principals and teachers on this call may have been educated overseas. Um, there's a really particular reason for asking that. The, the reason is that the curriculum in other countries can be much stronger than ours in general, so. Oh, that's a good question to ask. Um... So you mean if they were a, they themselves went through like K to twelve schooling? K to twelve. K to twelve. K to twelve schooling. Okay. There's Rikia. 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 Okay. Yeah. Where yeah. were you educated? You can talk. Let like me pa make sure. Pakistan. Okay. Did you have Did you have um, nationally normed assessments that were subject specific? That would probably follow from the former English nature of the region, like A levels or O levels. Yes, 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 <laughs> yes. That's what you awesome. want to do, right? <laughs> That's right. Well, I just, it's just, you will understand the difference between what our young people are given and what, what you were given, um, which was actually a gift as hard as it was. Um, So I did just change the settings so that people can unmute themselves. So um, you'll be able to you know, ask questions, we'll have a discussion. But I'd like to just, just begin by introducing Dr. Berner. First of all, thank you, Dr. Berner, so much for being here with us. We really, really appreciate it. And uh, thank you, those of you who are, are who registered for the session, we're happy to have you here as well. Um, Dr. Berner is the director of the Johns Hopkins Institute for Education Policy and the Associate Professor of Education. She has served as the Deputy Director of the CUNY Institute for Education Policy and as an Administrator at the Institute for Advanced Studies and Culture, University of Virginia. She, um, she's, released, she's written many books, but this one, Plural, Pluralism in American Public Education, No Way to School. If you're able to get a hold of that, that's something I think you'll find very, very interesting. She led the design of the Institute's School Culture 360 um, survey, which some, many of our schools participated in. And with Director David Steiner, she designed the um, Institute's knowledge maps. Her teaching experience took place in a Jewish prep preschool, an Episcopal secondary school, and an open university in Louisiana. Dr. Berner holds degrees from Davidson College and from Oxford University. I'm going to give her the the mic now, so to speak, and inshallah, well, let's look forward to hearing from her. Well, it's um, it's a real honor to be with you all. I am among friends here, I know, and I have treasured my partnership with Sufia on many different boards and activities, and supporting Islamic schools is one of the things that gets me up in the morning. I'm delighted to be working with you all and having this conversation. So the Institute does exist to support those of you who are on the front lines. We are not on the front lines. We are background researchers, policy thinkers. We try to create research-based tools that you all can use. And we are very biased in favor of educational pluralism, which is what most democracies support a variety of schools on equal footing and hold them all accountable. And that's the book that I've written. I do a lot of work on educational pluralism. 
Um, when I lived at Oxford as a young mother uh, doing my doctorate, my little girls were in a, a faith-based school that was funded by the state. There was a, uh, an Islamic girls school that was started down the street from me. It was funded by the state and all the schools had the same strong curriculum. The ethos of the school was different, of course. It was intended to be. But I hope you'll just interrupt me as we go through this conversation. I don't want it to be a lecture and I may not be able to see your chats, but I know you'll interrupt me, flag me down at any point. So one of the things we talk about with all of our partners, whether it's a state partner, district, Catholic diocese, Islamic school, scholarship granting organization is this, there are two levers that every school can pull to help their students learn more and become more active citizens. There are two, so there are two, two really critical levers. The first is a strong school culture, and the second is an intellectually challenging curriculum. Now, just very briefly about culture, because we won't be talking about that today. There are a lot of climate surveys. There are a lot of culture surveys. Most of them don't touch what we're talking about here. When we say school culture, we're talking about a moral vocabulary, whether it's secular, Islamic, Catholic, Jewish, socialist, where the mission is clear, the values are clear, the stakeholders are aligned, and there's a common ethos. And even if you have people in the community who disagree somewhat, they still join the community because of its ethos. So that's really important. And research shows that when you do that well and consistently, students have a much greater chance of being civically tolerant. And by that, I don't mean anything goes. I mean, able to hold strong views and disagree with respect. We certainly need more of that um, in this world, uh, in this country right now. An intellectually challenging curriculum. By this, I mean something very specific. Many of you here, your American um, teachers talk about the um, standards aligned curriculum. Have you ever heard that, com that comment, a standards aligned curriculum? So the standards aligned, I'm so sorry, I've got to turn this phone off. I didn't realize it was on, sorry. Okay, it stopped. Um, so a, a um, standards aligned curriculum simply says that certain skills will be reinforced in this or that curriculum. Now in math, a standards aligned curriculum is pretty close to a knowledge building curriculum because in math, you demonstrate that you understand division as a concept by actually doing fractions or doing long division. But when you get to the humanities subjects, a standards aligned curriculum is insufficient because a standards aligned curriculum simply says, develop the skill of finding the main idea, of providing evidence for, of summarizing for. Those skills are important, but they a standards aligned ELA or social studies curriculum alone misses the knowledge building component. So when I talk about an intellectually challenging curriculum, I mean something that is sequenced and spiraled, that intentionally builds knowledge and skills come along as part of that. Does anybody have any comments or questions so far? Because we're gonna dive into this area in depth. No? Okay. Um, slide. So the question is, why is it important? And I've got two slides on this because it's the key anchor to this whole conversation. We all know about the achievement gaps between first generation kids and wealthy families. Now, the Islamic population, the parents have very high education levels. We have found that in our research that uh, particularly the mothers tend to be more educated than their matched peers whose kids go to non-Islamic schools. So that's very interesting. But in general, the achievement gaps in our country between well-off and wealthy families are driven in large part by, by the knowledge gap. Now, why is that? What do I mean? So if you pick up the New York Times or you pick up a, a actually 
almost any op-ed in the country. You're going to see references to American history, to, to international history, to geography. You can't really do, you can't have a conversation about foreign policy if you don't know where, say, Pakistan is or what the history is or the significance of the Persian Gulf or, you know, that Mexico is actually um, reachable by car from the United States, those kinds of things. Now, families that are from well, well-resourced families talk about this stuff in their dinner conversations. They read to their kids, they take them on trips, they take them to museums, but first-generation low-income families don't provide that. They can't for many reasons. And so our institute follows a long body of research that suggests that this content knowledge is a matter of equity. And again, it is something that every school can do to improve their students' preparation for life ahead. Um, and a couple other things about a knowledge-rich curriculum. It's about background knowledge. It's about high quality content. Every source that's in front of your children should be in and of itself very, very high quality. Our institute does evaluate curriculum and we have very elaborate rubrics for what counts as high quality. There's a, a psychology, developmental psychologist at UVA named Dan Willingham, and he writes and studies what happens when you bring a content rich curriculum, for want of a better word, a liberal arts curriculum to young people. And he talks about the stickiness of knowledge, that the more you know, the more you can know those through lines. And I was chatting before this, this we got off the ground here um, with someone from Pakistan who had studied the English A-levels and O-levels and European curricula have tended to be knowledge building. Every kid in the country, when my kids were in school in England, everyone had access to Greek and Roman culture in a certain year. Everyone had access to the, you know, the Middle Ages in a certain year. And it was repetitive, it's sequenced and spiraled and it's thick. Well, that's what we're talking about by the stickiness of knowledge. You remember that you learn this and a good teacher who knows, oh my gosh, my kids had this in second grade. In fourth grade, they can say, now you remember in second grade when you had, you talked about Roman road building, for example. Also, children need to see themselves represented. You've probably heard about the windows and mirrors, but one of the things we look for in a high quality curriculum is, are there multiple voices, multiple viewpoints, so that we're not just doing, say, the Western canon. Um, and I have several colleagues who do this very well. Additionally, there will be multiple perspectives that create all together a common speech community. Any comments or questions on that? Before we go to the next slide. Okay, let's see if I can get this to work. Okay, so I'm just gonna walk through very quickly some of the findings that we have seen across the country in our knowledge map. We have uh, evaluated almost 30 ELA and social studies curricula for their sequenced curriculum for their knowledge build in different areas. And of course, a really rich text is gonna build knowledge in multiple domains. So if you have something like um, their eyes were watching God, it's not going to just build knowledge about one thing. It's gonna teach you about rural life in the South after the Civil War. It will talk about relationships, many, many things. So a good text will build knowledge in different areas. Um, and it, it, if there are culturally responsive um, sources and voices in there. And these are some of the things that we have found. Very strong inattention to providing a consistent knowledge build. We even, in looking at these ELA and social studies curricula, we have found that even within a given unit, the texts aren't working in the same direction. You may have a great novel, but they're scaffolded with stuff that has nothing to do with it. So that's a missed opportunity. Sometimes when school systems go for culturally relevant sources, they find, they choose things that are not. They choose Newsella and other things that are just not the highest optimal quality. And then particularly with publisher created curricula, 
And I'm going to give some examples of this. Some of the biggest publishers will write their own texts, particularly in elementary school, and they're just boring. And they emphasize social and emotional learning without doing anything else. So this is something we have seen again and again in the field. We also conduct teacher surveys on materials use where we ask anonymously teachers, you know, what are you using for math? What are you using? Let's just focus on English. What are you using for English? Which curriculum, which other sources do you draw on? What do you think of those sources? What do you use them for? How many hours a week do you spend creating your own lessons? And this, these findings we have, we've seen again and again, we've done this with systems across the country, reflects national norms. Often, even principals sometimes don't know what resources their teachers are using. Teachers in general usually create their own lessons, even if there's an expected curriculum. Google, Pinterest, and Teachers Pay Teachers are the ones they're using, and teachers often receive very little support on how to deliver instructional rigor. This is challenging. This is really tough for anybody, but teachers need support. They, you know, principals have to do so many things, particularly in smaller schools. Um, you know, you, administration, fundraising, operations, all this, but there has to be a backbone of instructional rigor. And then we've done classroom observations, and this is also nationally normed that teachers routinely under challenge students. Um, does any of this ring true for anybody on the call? So what I actually wanted to say is, um, I know you're, you're talking about content rich curriculum and the uh, there's unwritten curriculum and there's you know the background knowledge and and so on and, and a lot of our i've seen a lot of schools be not confident enough perhaps is the word to develop their own curriculum so for the academic subjects they will just go with whichever publisher they've selected for the various textbooks and the supplementing sometimes happens sometimes doesn't happen maybe other principals on the call can can speak to that but how do we I guess to, to break through that, that um, not a barrier really, but we, we just, we, our schools wanna make sure that we're providing the best curriculum, the best education for our students. We, we wanna make sure that they, they're not handicapped in any way. When they go on to, if it's a K to eight school, they go into high school or to college. So we stick with you know the textbooks that are out there or the state standards. So what I feel like I'm hearing from you is, there's a need to really rethink that. Well, I wouldn't say completely. So some of the published curricula are spectacular. So for example, Great Minds, Wit and Wisdom is outstanding. It is culturally, it is, they have, you know, the, the classics alongside of newer things. I am Malala next to the Iliad and the Odyssey. And it's very intentional. And a lot of schools, actually some of the Florida schools, I think some of the Islamic schools are starting to use that. Um, the core knowledge language arts is excellent. Um, I'm happy to talk to anyone, you know, after this, you can contact me. I've got my, you know, just about what we see that's good. So it's not that, it's not that there's nothing really good out there. There, there are, it's that if you're just going with HMH, you know, Harcourt Brace and, you know, whatever it used to be Harcourt Brace and, and Houghton Mifflin and so forth that the district is using, you may be missing an opportunity. Now, there is something called Ed Reports, which some of you know. Ed Reports, it's edreports.org, and they evaluate math and ELA curricula for standards alignment. Again, in math, that's very, very good. But in English, standards alignment, they, you know, is it's just, it doesn't <coughs> ensure knowledge building. Um, so I'm happy to just, just talk to me anytime, you know, Sufia, you can be the, the, the gateway or I, you can, people can contact me directly. Um, I did put a link um, in the chat to the knowledge, the curriculum tab on your, uh, the Johns Hopkins Institute. Great. We've released a bunch of social studies knowledge maps. We're going to be releasing a bunch of English ones on the 22nd of February. There was another raised hand. I, I saw Asma Mana, go for it Asma. Sister Asma, you had a question? No, what happened to her? 
Should we just keep going and let people jump in as we go? Yeah. I see oh, yes. Mr. Muhammad also has a hand. Go for it. Yes. To unmute myself. Um, I I had my hand up. I, I guess maybe, I don't know if you want to address it now or later, but I guess one of my struggles um, was selling to the parents, I guess, the idea that we need to move away, not move completely away from a textbook, but that supplementing a textbook is not wrong in teaching. Um, I don't know if that question makes sense or yes. not. You yes. Know, a lot of parents are just hung up on textbooks, textbook, textbook. Why is she not teaching from a textbook? Um, not realizing that we need to tailor the content from the textbook for our students' needs. I think that that's a challenge. And to some degree, there are a couple of responses. First, textbooks are not all of the same quality. So Correct. some textbooks may not even be worthy te of teaching straightforwardly. We are just working with one district school system to actually add primary sources to their textbook because the textbook has no primary sources. And this is a social studies textbook. Um, I do think that as a school leader, you have to be careful that when teachers are adding and supplementing, the ideal would be to norm across the whole school so that if a great, if one teacher is fantastic at adding new challenging material to a given unit, that the kids aren't disadvantaged if they go then to a ne the next year, they're in somebody else's class and they're not as good at it. So, you know, what one thing you can do is to, um, you know, show your teach, so show the parents before and after. Here's what the unit looks like before our teachers embellished it. Here's what it looks like now. And here's how this thickens up the knowledge build, if that makes sense. That might give parents, you know, a little more encouragement. But if I and I see it's a problem. But you again, you want to walk that fine line between saying to teachers, when the door closes, it's your classroom, because you don't know how consistent the 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 teachers are from room to room. And we can talk more about that later too. Other other questions? Brother Muhammad, go ahead and unmute yourself and ask a question. Uh, it happened now. Okay, Dr. Ashley, um, thank you very much. I um, uh, introduced uh, more than one interesting issue. Uh, number one, uh, intellectually challenge curricula. Until this lecture, I used to focus on student intellectuality. Now you add it, intellectually challenge curricula. Then you move quickly to the publishers. Um, this means we need to depend, or right now we depend on publishers in presenting the textbook. Why that? Is there any other solution? Yes, there are, there are op well, there are a couple of solutions. First is if you're going, if you have a, a textbook, make sure that you're adopting the very best one that does a lot of that work for you. Because something like guidebooks or wit and wisdom have built in not only challenging materials, but Socratic seminars. So they have pedagogical prompts for teachers that help them do the piece of what we call productive struggle. Like you don't want to spoon feed kids. You want them to be confronted with really big questions and reason it through to the ground. And that is a learned habit. It's a learned skill. So I think what you're saying is, look, it's not just about the textbooks. You're absolutely right. It's about getting the very best textbook. By the way, some of the curricula are online exclusively. And so it may not even be a printed book. Um, the pedagogical piece is the most, is really, really critical no matter what, which materials you're using. You can also use something like our knowledge map framework and design your own curriculum. But I have to tell you, designing a curriculum is really tough. And it is really, really, really tough. And it's, I, I, I just would not, and especially in 
schools that are smaller, do you don't have the staff to really think, you know, why, why, why not, you know, so, and, and I'll say this too, some of the really good curricula, like the ones I've mentioned, have embedded assessments. So they have even checkpoints for a uh, check for understanding. Any other, but that's a, that's a good question. Um, creating the conditions for that productive struggle are very, are part of what teachers need, need help with and encouragement with. And is, does that answer your question so far? You're muted. You're, you're still muted. What should we do? Should we just keep going and come back? Okay, there's another, another question. Go ahead. Elam Academy, sister, go for it. Everyone should be able to unmute themselves. If you go on those little dots next to your name. Hmm. There we go. Oh, just muted yourself back. Why don't we keep going and we'll leave yeah. ample time at the end? Cause I may answer some of the questions or comments as we go Sounds along. Good. So I just want to spend a little bit of time before we actually look at practically, I want to spend a little bit of time explaining the why. Why does the United States struggle so much with an intellectually challenging content rich curriculum? There's actually a very poignant history here. Um, you know, most democracies, when they started expanding public education or national education or provincial education, they democratized the liberal arts. So they just it made it accessible for everyone. And some still do, but in the English speaking countries and particularly the States and for a while England, American education focused on process over content, learning how to learn instead of learning something in particular, right? I mean, if any of your teachers have gone through American teacher prep programs, I can guarantee you they will have heard learning how to learn is more important than learning something specific. Well, the research doesn't bear that up. You have to learn something specific to be able to do something with it. And it builds on itself. This whole movement, which was, I mean, you can call it progressive education, de-emphasize knowledge. I mean, there, it's hard to imagine how bitter this battle was. It was fought at places like Columbia Teachers College and um, you know, Northwestern and so forth, University of Illinois, but it became the dominant note in American history. You find the main idea from a decontextualized paragraph instead of actually homing in on a particular text and its particular context. So I could go on and on about this because there's a rich history, but suffice it to say that we now in general in the States have a teaching force that has not experienced a Socratic seminar, a liberal arts education, doesn't know what they're missing. And I can tell you this, we spend a lot of time actually working with teachers and systems trying to help get buy-in to the knowledge building piece of it. And again, most countries do the opposite. The highest performing countries in the world have, you know, they have a set curriculum. They fund a variety of schools. So parents know that they're getting the ethos, the values that they want their children to have, but everybody comes out of a certain of high school with a similar body of knowledge. And there are, there are huge advantages to that for individual students and for a country. So some positive examples, I'm just gonna go over, I've got two slides that have, that show why things are turning around. 
by the way, there's a great book on this. It's by Natalie Wexler and it's called The Knowledge Gap. And she's a journalist and she popularized a lot of this research and made it very digestible. And she's, it's, been, it's a bestseller. And school systems across the country are trying to change their approach. So just a couple, two examples. Um, Chicago in, the, in 1997, put the International Baccalaureate Diploma Program in Chicago's poorest high schools. And the kids who went through that for four, four years, even though only 20% of them passed the diploma, which is the big end result, even though tw only 20% passed, the national rate is 70%, um, they still had a 40% greater chance of going to university. And it was so powerful, those persistent results, that Rahm Emanuel, the mayor, um, made IB a huge, a huge bet for the, the whole system. Duval County, Florida, put core knowledge language arts and Eureka math in its schools. And those of you who work in Florida became famous. There are six districts and a lot of private schools and charter schools that are following suit because the kids, even on something as bare bone as the state assessments, the kids were doing much, much, much better. And, and, and it was challenging. I mean, you go in these classrooms, Baltimore City did this. They put wit and wisdom into their, I mean, Baltimore City is the lowest performing school district in the country. They put wit and wisdom in and these little kids who could not read are all of a sudden talking about, you know, incredible subjects in art and music and history. Um, the national member organization that supports state commissioners has a whole initiative on high quality instructional materials. They're supporting 13 states and Chiefs for Change, which is a partner we have, we spend a lot of time with. They have really innovative superintendents and uh, district leaders. They've made a big bet on curriculum as well. We do curriculum audits for them all over the country. A lot of major districts that we've worked with, certainly a lot of charter schools and a lot of, of NAIS schools, um, Catholic schools are starting to use better materials. So there are really bright spots. And because I, I'm on the board of the Council for American Private Education, and I love, I'm an, an independent school kid myself. I want all schools, particularly faith-based schools, to not fall behind, you know, and the, the, one of the glories of private education has been a stronger intellectual curriculum and a better school culture. And those are things we, we want to champion and celebrate. So I'm just going to pause before I give two examples from the field that kind of illustrate what I'm talking about. Anybody have any more, any comments? You, you have some um, questions in the chat, Ms. Berner, if you want to read them or if you want me to read them. Oh, you read it, you read it, it's better for me. Um, one is, do you think this is what the Common Core attempted to achieve? And then the second one is, education is in a downward spiral because today we have teachers delivering the lessons as opposed to actually teaching and sharing knowledge. And this is not by teacher's choice, they're forced to follow a certain curriculum, whether it's suitable or not to certain students? Okay, good. these are good questions. So the Common Core State Standards did, I know David Coleman who helped write those and he then became the head of college board. He did not think that this country could bear, and he, I'm sure he was right, a national curriculum that said, look, not, not this text has to be read, but you must study this and you must study you know, English literature and romantic poetry or whatever it is. Um, so the, the standards were the best they could do. And you know, it, we will never by kind of law, we're never gonna have a national curriculum. So, you know, sure standards did try to bring commensurate testing across the country and in math, it was very, you know, more successful because again, we're not dealing with the concepts and the skills are so aligned. But in ELA, it, it has been um, just a standards focus is not sufficient, but there is some overlap with the common core in math in particular. The question about 
teachers are forced to do a certain curriculum. We have seen actually, it, it, let me just back, but back up for a second. What teachers and kids need differs depending on where the school is in its alignment and in its intellectual success. So sometimes teachers who have, are well-educated know exactly what to do. And they, they're the ones who, who think, you know, I could do better than this curriculum, this canned curriculum. First-year teachers and struggling schools, particularly public schools, sometimes really need those scripted lessons to make sure that all the kids are getting access to the same material. So I can understand why certain school leaders want to say, look, guys, we're all going to cover the same thing just to make sure we're getting, you know, the right information to our kids. But, um, you know, there, there should absolutely be a spectrum of what different teachers see in the field, what they think needs to happen. I would simply say to, to it, it really depends on the context. I mean, I, I loved creating my own curriculum, but you know, I was in a very different context in which I could. A um, couple other things. One of the, the truths is that even the best curricula out there don't provide scaffolding for different kinds of kids. And there are other ways to go about that, but it is something that, that a good curriculum should try to do at least to say, if you've got kids who are behind below grade level, here's, here's the piece that you need to give them first and, and things like that. Um, it's not just a forced march, it shouldn't be. And then finally, the pedagogical skill of delivering something is that that needs support. Teachers need support. You know, you can take even, I mean, a, a good teacher who's confident in delivering and engaging with students can take even the, the most kind of boring lesson and make it come alive. So really giving to, you know, one of the things, one of the recommendations we make a lot is spend all of your professional development time on excellent classroom instruction. That is going to pay dividends. Don't spend it on, you know, for a long, that's, that's, we all need help with that. We all need practice with that. How do you elicit questions? How do you, you know, get all kids talking and things like that? Um, other comments or questions before we go on? Sister Asma, go for it. You should be able to unmute. Okay, it works now. Thank you so much. Um, uh, thank you so much. What you're talking about is completely relevant. I guess, kind of to reiterate what you're saying and put it in context of what I'm, I guess, dealing with. Um, I've worked in public, I mean, private school, basically my entire teaching career. And what ends up happening a lot of times that I've personally experienced is that you don't, you're not always in the same classroom teaching the same classes, teaching the same grade level. So a lot of times it feels like you're moving, you're staying at the same school, but you're really a first year teacher over and over and over and over again. And so um, when you're dealing with content and trying to, you know, like maybe not embellish the content, but make it, tailor it towards your student needs, I guess, what would you suggest or recommend to kind of because there's so much information now, right? It, there's, you could get into that black hole of, you know, here's a lesson, here's what you could do with it while still sticking to, I guess, do you base it on the standards first and then kind of embellish as you go? I, I, don't I know would, I would, I would, and I'll show you some examples of what we've done mm -hmm. to help, help schools and school systems embellish. I would focus on the content. If you've right. got, if you've got, um, first of all, I don't think as a matter of practice that it's a good idea to switch teachers around from grade to grade to grade. Um, but but what, what I would always say is, you know, in math, again, that's having a good math curriculum where the content and skills are cumulative, that's worth gold. And I can give you some recommendations of good ones. But in the humanities fields, if you start with the content and you say, okay, here's the unit we have to teach, if it has some really good anchor texts, a, a great novel or a cluster of really important concepts, 
then embellish it by getting, by just thinking about from a child's perspective, what else do they need to know as background knowledge to understand this text better? And I am going to give some examples of that because, but that's an excellent question. I would always go with the content and, you know, not to say that if you're, if you've got a novel that you have to find other novels. No, I mean, you know, it can be a, a movie or a piece of art, or it can be, you know, uh, an article about, but just so that it's mutually reinforcing. Um, and I think some of the, sometimes teachers are in a situation in which the leadership of the school does not understand the difference between boilerplate standards aligned teaching and an alive classroom. And it can be immensely discouraging if you're a teacher pushing against that kind of culture. So, you know, there you write to me and I'll send you some of the research that we've done. And you can at least try to have that conversation. Other questions? Sister from uh, Elm Academy, go for it. Um, I teach in a, I taught in a traditional classroom for a very long time. And the materials taught was, you know, usually lost in a few months. The concepts that I taught, uh, being a Montessori teacher, I mean, I teach kindergarten, but believe me, I mean, I have taught third grade, level concepts, uh, four-year-olds are learning multiplication, uh, three-year-olds are easy, are you know, able to do division. The material is so rewarding for the children and for as a teacher, it's just like, you know, they get it. You they can do. teach a child, you know, concepts from multiplication. They have memorized the times table. They can do the square root. They are kindergartners. They know the solar system. You tell me parts of the earth. I mean, they they have learned the you know the the, the states you know by heart where each state is. Why it's can't amazing. we adopt Montessori philosophy for the other grades where you know everybody is just struggling with the instruction time and the concepts? The children lose it. Repetition is the key. And you know when the children teach. 90% of the learning is when the children are teaching the younger ones. So I have a three-year-old, four-year-old, and a five-year-old. I wish you could teach every kid in the country. I mean, the children are absolutely capable of so much learning. They, they're curious. They soak it up. And, you know, it, if you provide this feast for them consistently, you know, the delight that they have, um, it's, it, it, we have so much wasted time with so much boring stuff for kids. I, I, I share your, I, I hear you. And again, I just wish you could teach all of our kids. Other, other comments before we go on to the examples. Okay. So, um, this is actually a, a real story. I went into a, a district and was doing some professional development with social studies teachers for middle school. And the text was the preamble to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. That was the text. So, you know, this is a rich document. It is one of, I think it's the most downloaded, most read document, secular document in the world. Whereas recognition of the inherent dignity and the, let me move this so I can see and of the equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family is the foundation of freedom, justice, and peace in the world. Whereas disregard and contempt for human rights have resulted in barbarous acts, which has outraged the conscious, conscience of mankind. Okay, so I'm not gonna read the whole thing, but we know that it's a really rich document. It goes on and on and on, okay. So the first classroom that I went to let me go stop this here. Oops. Okay. This I shouldn't go on to example number two. The back to the 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 Declaration of Human Rights. A standards aligned classroom is going to look at some this first paragraph. Let me get back to this. Sorry. And what this is the way a standards aligned classroom will operate. Okay. What does inalienable mean? in the first paragraph and find evidence 
in the second paragraph that this is about human rights. That is the kind of approach that a standards aligned classroom will take. And that's what these teacher instructional coaches were doing. They were saying, here's what we do when we have this document. We'll look at um, the vocabulary. We'll look at find evidence for X, Y, and Z. And here's what a liberal arts classroom will look like. A teacher will say, this document is, out, it is an amazing, breathtaking document. When was it written? When was it passed? Oh, after the Second World War. Well, who disagrees with this? Who, who thinks that humans don't have an inherent dignity? Why would it be important to even say this? And then elicit from the kids their recollection of what happened in the Second World War with genocide, the Holocaust. And, and then, then, you know, really unpack that. Like, why does this even have to be articulated in the first place? Within that, of course, you can answer the vocabulary, but then you can take students to their present time and to the fact you could say, what was going on in the United States at the time that made it a little strange that the United States was signatory? Well, we still had segregated education and so forth. And we still, you know, how could we as American young people, I'm pretending I'm a kid now, how can we use this document to interrogate our own community and culture? And how can we live up to these standards? So does that, you see what I'm saying? It, it, uh, uh, going from a standards aligned classroom to one that's really asks the big questions about meaning and purpose and the good life. In an Islamic school, as in a, as you could in a Catholic school, you can also talk about the divine, the, the, um, the theological backdrop for the dignity of the human person. How would you translate that into an Islamic classroom? You know, this is something that other democracies do very effectively when they fund religious schools or socialist schools or Montessori schools, they provide an opportunity for these rich texts to be framed explicitly in the norms and values of the school. The second Dr. Is, Ash, Dr. Yes. Ashley, I have a quick uh, uh, question on the chat. What are yes. some strategies for teachers to embellish the curriculum and make it come alive? As you mentioned, as a first year teacher, when you're trying to balance teaching multiple grades with a different curriculum. I slow down and really suck the meat out of the bones of everything you're reading. If you're, and if you're embellishing, focus on the content. So I'm going to show you some examples right now of how you can re-scaffold it. But the most important um, is to say, what's the background knowledge that kids need to know to understand this text better? And then go after those sources. And, and I, I do have some strategies and suggestions there, but that's what I'm actually glad you asked because that's what we're gonna talk about right now. So in 2017, our Institute reviewed Baltimore City's English language arts curriculum. It was created by the district and it was, had some strong novels in it, but by and large, it was a hot mess. They were, you know, a motley crew of low grade, you know, low quality articles from New Zella and the same poem, Robert Frost was read, the same two Robert Frost poems were read again and again and again in three different grades. One poem from the Harlem Renaissance. And they, you know, it's a majority minority district. So 40% of their texts were about the African-American experience but the majority of those texts were about police brutality and incarceration and enslavement. And there was nothing about the commensurate accomplishments. So when we presented this report to the superintendent, she was so mad that she adopted wit and wisdom and K to eight immediately. And she wrote about this in the Washington Post that the, that the curriculum was failing the kids. And then I worked with them, my team worked with them to redesign their ninth through 12th grade um, lessons because they couldn't afford to adopt ninth through 12th. 
So here's, here's what we did. I'm just gonna pull out one unit redesign, but this will illustrate what I'm talking about. So this is a book called The Other West Moore. Some of you may have read it. It's about, it's a true story about a young man who grew up in Baltimore City, whose mother got him into a military academy. He went on to go to college. He became a Rhodes Scholar. And you know, he went into the military and then went to college, became a Rhodes Scholar. And he's actually running for the governor of, of Maryland right now. There was actually a kid named Wes Moore who was his, his exact same age. Who didn't, whose parents didn't give him those opportunities, same context as a baseline, who ended up in prison. So it's a very poignant story. And the way that, it, that the unit around it was designed at first, it was incoherent. Um, the supporting texts, there was something called Smokers of Paper by an Italian poet. There was a an article about devastating shark attacks. It, it's some, in some sense about overcoming, I think, but they were, you know, a modern story about the Baltimore, you know, in the Baltimore sun about a murder and then psychological resilience and then something about Japanese internment camps. So you can see, even though they were not bad texts, they had nothing to do with the background knowledge that you needed to understand the other West more. So let me show you what it looked like after we redesigned it. We read the novel again and we said, look, to understand this entirely, you need to understand racial prejudice in the late 20th century. Colin Powell was a big figure in the book. We want students to know something about who this man was and what he stands for. Um, Kurt Schmoke was um, the mayor. Um, he's, he is, uh, you know, was mayor of New York, of Baltimore for a long time. He was the only mayor to stand up against criminalizing the crack cocaine epidemic, by the way. He's mentioned a lot. He was a Rhodes Scholar. Wes Moore was a Rhodes Scholar. So we said, these kids need to know what a Rhodes Scholar is. Because who are we to say they might not try for a Rhodes Scholarship one day? Isn't that the whole point? And the Baltimore riots also played a big part in the novel. So we went back and we found Baltimore Sun retrospectives of the, Baltimore, of the, the riots of 1968. We had a whole section on Colin Powell, his membership in the Academy of Achievement. We had a, you know, one of his addresses and you know, they could listen to on the role of the military in his formation. Um, <clears throat> we had the New York Times article about black, the role that the military played for black soldiers. And then a lot of articles uh, from that time period about crack cocaine. And because it comes up again and again in the second half of the book. And then we got a video for, from the Rhodes Scholarship Foundation. It's two minutes long, three minutes long, what the Rhodes Scholarship means to me because these things make sense of the novel. One of the others that we did um, was Persepolis, which is a fabulous novel. Many of you may know it about a young girl during the revolutions in, in, in Iraq, and, I mean, Iran. And it, again, Baltimore City had this great novel, but it was scaffolded with stuff that had nothing to do with the context. So what we did is we got a State Department critical report on the Persian Gulf and historical pieces about Iran. And we had the, the US, the day the U, we had the Baltimore Sun on the day the hostages were taken and the day the hostages were released, those two articles. We also had Hafez, the most famous Persian poet. We had several, he's mentioned in the text of Persepolis. So we included some of his richest poems that were appropriate for kids. Um, we also had um, selections from, we had some writings about Islam, you know, from um, the Quran and, and also from the book by Stephen Prothero called Religious Literacy of how important it is to understand. And, and anyway, it was a totally new, it was a totally new unit that actually built up the background knowledge for the novel. So they're all working together. <clears throat> and and that's the kind of approach that 
I would recommend you take when you're, you know, scaffolding something is say, look, what do we really, what, 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 what's the background knowledge here? How can we make it alive? Um, some of the, you know, artwork is wonderful for this. But photography is wonderful for this. And again, you want to start out, and this is something that, so I used to teach comparative religion and ethics. And one of the things I, I did at the very beginning of the semester, and this is totally appropriate for any subject, for particularly secondary students, to say human life has, you know, there is something universal in the questions that we ask. Time and place are, they change, but our questions about what is the meaning of life? Is there a good? Is there a God? If there is a God, what is God like? How do we know? You know, why is there suffering? Um, is what is a good society look like? These are baseline questions. And so what you didn't see and what I just showed you is the background workshop that we worksheet that we had internally of like, these are the big questions that we need to really home in on. So when we designed the lesson, we didn't just add these great texts we added the great questions and we got the kids used to asking the big questions so they could do it the next year in a different context and they could do it in a different subject. And um, so I think I've just gone on and on and I haven't left enough time for your questions. So forgive me, I'm ready for questions. I'm stopping now. No, I, I love the way you made it interactive. We had a lot of questions throughout, but we have a few more minutes left. So if you have any questions, you can uh, raise your hand or unmute yourself. Um, I don't see anything new in the chat. Um, uh, one question, how long did it take to reformat that ninth grade unit you just discussed? Well, I would say it depends on how much, how much concerted effort you have. I, have. I had to work with the Baltimore City teachers, teaching teacher leads to do it. So if, you know, if you're just sitting down and doing it, you could probably do it in a couple of weeks. If you're doing it as a committee and you're trying to, you know, it, it, you should allow a year to do it. And in that case, we just did 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th unit one and got it ready for the fall. And then we, we, but while it was starting to go in the field, we were doing unit two. And then by the end of the year, we had all four, but you'd be surprised. We did these very low budget videos to explain to the teachers what the excitement about this bit, this particular unit was. So we would say, you know, Persepolis, this is about coming of age in a really conflicted time. And what you're going to see are big questions about identity, about God, about the just society, about the interaction of religion and state. Are they separable in what ways? And, you know, these are the big questions you're going to be dealing with. And so we, you know, trying to build the excitement for teachers and then, you know, then, then, then the teaching and learning team worked with them in delivering it. Other questions? So I'm wondering if any uh, teachers or principals in, the, in this session have a concern about, you know, if you stray, so-called stray, quote unquote, from the curriculum that's been given or provided by the districts or the state standards, how will the, these kids um, do on the standardized assessments that are given? Don't we have to make sure, because if we're trying to now embellish the curriculum, we get focused on bringing in this and that, will it take away from what they need to know in order to do well on the, the standardized test that the school gives, which you know we provide that to the public to say, oh, here's how our kids are doing, they're scoring, you know, is that, might that be a concern for teachers and principals? It is, I think the, the, here's the best answer. In math, sticking to the, um, and, and, and math, again, the standards alignment is probably gonna get you, if you're, if you're doing that, you don't need to leave, if you've got a good curriculum, you don't need to leave the curriculum to prepare for the tests. Um, so math, I don't think you need to depart too much um, if you've got a good curriculum. In English, if you've got a good curriculum and the, the, and the work that you're doing with it is standards aligned. So if you're taking these great texts and you're asking kids out loud, 
well, show me the evidence for this, you know, in the process of all the others, your kid, your kids are going to do better on the assessment. And here's the thing. There's a lot of research that shows that kids who have more background knowledge do better on standards aligned assessments than kids who are better readers, but who don't have that background knowledge. So um, I will tell you, there's an experiment right now in Louisiana and our institute's working on it where the state has actually been granted the ability to give four stakes annual assessments that are based on the curriculum. And it's really been fascinating because the kids are, it's wit and wisdom and guidebooks, the two most commonly used ELA curricula in the state. The kids, the teachers are staying, you know, they used to teach this great content and then abruptly stop to prep for the ELA assessments. And now they're staying in it and they're, the kids are doing better on the assessment. So they're, they, but I, I understand the concern. I just, the research is pretty clear that background knowledge drives assessment results. Kids who know more about base, you know, more about the subjects are going to do better um, on, a, on a standard assessment. Of course, you have to make sure you're doing the right, you're, that you're, you know, giving the right skills in the process. Yeah, I think Ooh. that's uh, the, the, the one comment that came in, like embellishing doesn't mean we're not teaching standards. That's true. I think the concern might be when you take the time to embellish, meaning you're taking that leap of faith and you're thinking, I have limited time. If I'm going to embellish my curriculum, will it take time away from making sure that I complete whatever curriculum map I've been given, you know, the scope and sequence that I have? That might be the concern. I think that's uh... well. I, I can understand that, but in in ELA, the the standards become very repetitive. They're basically the same standards year after year after year. And so, if you are, you know, it's comp compare and contrast. Find the main idea. You know, provide evidence that this is the stuff that you would do with kids in middle school and high school as they're writing early research, you know, kind of report papers, you know, provide evidence in the text of this viewpoint that you have. So don't forsake those skills. That's basic skills that kids need to have, interpretive, comparative skills, but just weave it into rich texts. And I don't want to imply that the, the gold standard is just spending a lot of time embellishing. If you, you know, if you get a really good curriculum, you're not going to have to embellish very much is the truth. I mean, you look at something like core knowledge, it's published by Amplify now. It's stunning. And the kids who are using curricula like that are doing better, you know, than, I don't know, it, core knowledge is fantastic. And, and I have, Friends who lead charter schools with core knowledge as its base, the kids are scoring their first generation low income kids uniformly outperforming wealthier kids in wealthier districts because of the curriculum. Outstanding, outstanding. I see um, a lot of once a teacher understands what they need to teach, they can choose their delivery methods, meaning understand the standards and teach them with embellishments. Another uh, comment was like, you need to know your content. Yeah, I know it's challenging for, you know, in your first years uh, of teaching, but once you know your curriculum and your content inside and out, um, then you'll be able to add these em em embellishments. Uh, Alhamdulillah, we have reached 12 o'clock. Um, so to respect everyone's time, I want to thank Dr. Ashley Berner. Please give everybody, give her a round of applause. That was an outstanding presentation. You have really um, struck a chord with all of our attendees. They're very happy um, with this presentation and um, they will take all of this knowledge uh, back. So Dr. Ashley, thank you for sharing oh, your experience thanks. and uh, expertise with us. We are now going to be on a lunch break. I have put the, um, uh, the survey for uh, this session uh, in the chat. So please make sure you're do, um, you complete it uh, today. And then our last session will be at two o'clock Pacific Standard Time or five o'clock Eastern Time. Uh, let us end with um, a short dua. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Wal Asr.
innal insana lafi khu illa alladhina amanu wa amilu salihati wa tawasaw bil haqqi wa tawasaw bis sabr subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun wa salamun alal mursalin walhamdulillahi rabbil alamin thank you again assalamu alaikum please enjoy the rest of the conference and tomorrow the full day thank you dr ashley thank you sister Pleasure. sophia bye